Well, I wish to thank, of course, the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And um, I will start with a little introduction. I mean, like Vincent before me, perhaps to apologize, because, well, you can ask, why is this topic of any relevance for this workshop? Uh, well, uh, as I will try to argue, uh, my excuse is that by looking at these uh, <coughs> Gedanken experiments at energies much larger than <coughs> the Planck scale, and in a regime where collapse is not expected, uh, I emphasize that, of course, we arrive at an S matrix which is on one hand unitary, so information preserving, and on the other hand, it shows the emergence of the Hawking temperature scale, which is uh, something much smaller <coughs> than Planck. So, and in fact, the, l the, the farther you go in the incoming energy above and Planck, the lower you go in this characteristic energy scale, which will be the characteristic energy scale of what comes out of the process. The outline is this, uh, it's in two parts, rather disconnected, so if time doesn't allow, then I will skip, uh, uh, depending on the also on how many questions are asked and so on and so forth. <coughs> so I don't want to rush, but I have about uh, a little over one minute per slide. I don't know if I can make it in 50 minutes. I we don't know how many slides you have. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, about uh, uh, a little less than uh, the number of minutes I have. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, sorry, so the in part one we'll try to solve uh, an unsolved exercise which should have been a textbook exercise, <laughs> but it's not. So maybe in a future textbook it will appear. Uh, and this, I will deal with this problem in two ways. One is purely classical GR, and second is a quantum S matrix approach, and then I will compare the results, finding actually very good agreement, or perfect agreement, I would say. Of course, by taking a, a suitable limit of the quantum calculation. And then I will discuss the gravitational wave energy spectrum, we can also look at the angular spectrum, but in particular the energy spectrum and show that the integral of uh, this energy spectrum still has a logarithmic divergence. Of course, this we believe is due to some breakdown of some approximations at high frequency. And then uh, part two, it will be discussing a claim by Dvali, uh, Gomez et al and uh, with uh, uh, Massimo Bianchi and his student Andrea Adazi, uh, we have tried to reinterpret what they did and uh, I think the conclusion is quite interesting. And then I'll finish with a question. Uh, so the textbook exercise is very simple. Well, but let me start by saying, you know, the problem of computing gravitational wave emission by a binary system is almost as old as GR. It has become gradually very relevant for testing general relativity first. Remember the, uh, the pulsars uh, um, test of general relativity, and later for searches of gravitational waves, first in bars and interferometers, and, of course, even more recently after the observation of gravitational waves emitted by the coalescence of two black holes. Um, for instance, there is this effective one-body approach that Thibault and Alessandro Bonanno have pioneered. And, I will and there are, of course, the numerical relativity calculations. But most of the time, this process is in the non-relativistic regime, with the exception, perhaps, of the merging itself when high speeds, you know, roughly, say, V over C of the order 0.3 to 0.6 are reached. Now, of course, much less attention has been devoted to a more academic problem, 
uh, which is the following. Consider the collision of two massless or highly relativistic gravitationally interacting particles. We neglect every other interaction. In the regime, which is explained before a little bit later, in which they deflect each other's trajectory by a small angle, theta Einstein. And with, uh, with theta Einstein, much less than one, <coughs> so, but still much bigger than the inverse of gamma, which is very small. Uh, now, um, theta s or theta Einstein for small deflection angle is given by this generalization of OPS. Well, of Einstein's formula. Oh la la, my finger is too big. <coughs> okay, fine. Uh, so here is the definition of R, the short shear radius associated with the center of mass energy. Now the problem is to compute the gravitational wave spectrum which is associated with this collision to lowest order in the deflection angle and I remember I was having uh, lunch at uh, New York University at NYU uh, next to um, Andrei Gruzinov and he asked me how, how can it possibly be an unsolved problem he asked me yet I had asked several experts about whether that problem had been solved and nobody gave me a solution. So we decided to work on it and uh, so the classical general relativity calculation is based on work I did together with Andrei Kruzinov. Now what do we actually know uh, about <coughs> gravitational wave emission in general? Well there is a well-known zero frequency limit. You know it goes down to the 70s where, which gives us a solid prediction for d e d omega. Uh, as omega goes to zero, this limit is smooth, okay? It goes to a constant, the, this ratio. And it can be obtained either by classical or by quantum argument, and the latter uses well-known soft graviton theorems, which go back to the 60s, to Weinberg's work, for instance. And the result after the result for the process at hand, namely this high energy relativistic collision with small deflection angle, uh, is this, okay? Is this point no? d the omega g s over pi, the precise coefficient. Uh, you see it goes like the square of the deflection angle up to a logarithmic enhancement. And this is the omega going to zero limit. Now, uh, by the way, an interesting, this is parenthetical remark with, uh, again, with Adazi and Bianchi, we are trying to see whether the sub-leading corrections to the soft theorems that now people are working on, you know, several people, the, the, uh, whether that can give the first <coughs> correction to the spectrum. It is not quite obvious to, to us. And then to compare with what I will tell you later, because we pretend to have the spectrum up to a certain frequency, so to check whether the subleading soft corrections give indeed what we find by other methods would be interesting. It's still work in progress. Now, <coughs> the other thing we know is there is some work of the in the 70s, in particular by Peter Diaz, and Payne. They wrote several papers. Uh, this is very interesting work. Uh, they discuss mainly a regime which is not very interesting. It's a regime in which the deflection angle is smaller than 1 over gamma. Since our gamma will be infinite, that is not so interesting. But in this paper, they also he also has interesting remarks about the regime we are interested in. And actually, the result I will present uh, can be obtained by a suitable limit of what Diaz does. So this is a yet another check that we are on the, on the right <coughs> track. On the other hand, uh, Kip Thorne and Kovacs, in about the same time, 
you know, had an a nice paper saying that this gives a definitive treatment of classical gravitational bremsstrahlung produced by two stars at arbitrary mass flying past each other, so not merging, but just flying past each other. But you see only if the angle of gravitational deflection is much smaller than the inverse gamma to the minus one. So this is precisely what we are not interested in. So unfortunately, this very nice paper doesn't help. Third, there are numerical relativity calculations by the group of Pretorius, Sperhake, and also others. Uh, we contact, we, I mean uh, Grozinov and myself, contacted them, uh, and uh, <laughs> they admitted they <coughs> cannot cope with this numerically. And uh, the calculation is challenging because basically the deflected particles you know, when, when you have these two mm, massless particles collide and then deflect each other, then they have associated with them two shock waves. And the two shock waves travel as fast, almost as fast if they are ultra-relativistic and as fast as they if they are massless, uh, as the emitted waves themselves. So apparently numerically is very difficult to disentangle the actual Bremsstrahlung radiation from the shock waves produced by the final particles. Maybe they will make progress in the future, but for the moment they seem to be limited to Lorentz gamma factors of order three and and theta deflection angle a bit bigger than uh, bigger? or less, maybe less, than gamma to the minus one. OK, so now a first attempt to this problem uh, can be found in a paper I wrote with Amati and Ciafaloni uh, in <coughs> 2007, which, however, produced an energy crisis because we got, perhaps uh, as we learn later by uh, too naive an argument, a spectrum of the gravitational Bremsstrahlung, which, okay, has the right prefactor, but has the wrong exponential. Or rather, in this exponential, we like very much this uh, uh, damping, this damping factor in transverse momentum, with respect to the beam axis of one over b. B is the impact parameter of the collision, I should have said. But this, uh, this damping in frequency is too generous because, remember, we are at very small angles, so R square over B square is very small. So that means this is a very weak damping. And if you integrate this energy over omega, um, you get a very strange results. You find that the energy fraction emitted in gravitational waves is already order one for impact parameters still much larger than the Schwarzschild radius, namely at small deflection angle. And that particular Slava Richkov was making this remark to us smelled very bad. Okay? Something looked wrong. On the other hand, okay, it came out of our calculation. Now, of course, okay, I don't have time, of course, to review the work I did with Amati and Ciafaloni, but in this 2007 paper, we were making some strong approximation, trying to get to the critical points for collapse and so on. It was not the main aim of, the, of that work to find the spectrum, it was a byproduct but this byproduct could have been greatly affected by the approximations <coughs> we made. So, um, so, bottom line, we need the gravitational, the, sorry, the GR answer to the question, what is the actual cutoff in omega for the gravitational waves emitted in such a process? And uh, there, is, there are related questions 
for instance, is the, I mean, this cutoff in omega, is it singular in the massless limit? S second question, is it singular in the, quant in the, in the classical limit? Okay, because you could invent all sort of scales for for this cutoff in omega. I mean, you could say it's it's one over b. You can say it's one over r, or you can say uh, you know it's um, I forgot. I mean, uh, you you can take one over b times gamma if the limit m goes to zero is singular. Or you can use quantum mechanics and you can say that omega cannot be uh, uh, bigger, of course, than, uh, than, uh, than E over the, the total energy square root of S over H bar. <laughs> okay? In this case, the massless limit is singular. In the second case, the classical limit is singular. My answer to both questions is no, no. I don't think those limits are singular. As far as we know, um, uh, gravity has no collinear singularities. In other words, the emission of gravitons is not singular when the emitting particle it goes to zero mass, unlike what happens in gauge theories in four dimensions. But and, uh, and also, I don't believe that <coughs> you really need quantum mechanics to regulate this Bremsstrahl. So, um, so th the recent progress announced in the title, as I said, goes no back to there yes. There are no logs. There are lo There are soft logs. Okay. There are soft divergences, but no collinear divergence. So, if you take QED, then there are two kind of uh, infrared effects. One is the soft divergences, and those are common to gravity and gauge. And one are the collinear divergences when the well, the emission is collinear, which is precisely what happens if you have massless particles. And Weinberg already noticed uh, that, uh, that in, in gravity the, the second kind of divergences are not there. Uh, I'll come back to that. Okay, so, um, so as I said in the, mm, in the outline, I will present first the classical calculation that I did with Grosinov and there is parallel work by Spirin and Tomaras and in regions where we could compare the results there is also agreement and then I will come to the <coughs> quantum calculation. So the simple classical treatment that we did um, I must say mostly the idea came from Grosinov um, is obtained applying the Huygens principle uh, in the following way. I tried to draw a picture with uh, with a keynote, but you know it's a, it's a bit messy, so you you don't have to look at the whole details, but just to get the feeling, and then we'll see the formula, okay? And you'll see in the formula certain quantities that appear in the picture will be in the formula. So. This represents uh, supposedly, um, <coughs> you know, one shock wave is one particle which travels as z minus equals zero, namely z equal t. Okay, z is this direction. This is the other particle in green, which travels as z equal minus t. Okay, and they smash into each other as z equal t equal zero. Okay, these two shock waves. Then they are deflected, and I show only the deflection of the left moving guy, sorry, right moving, coming from the left, uh, which is this red thing. So you <coughs> see the, the black plane gets a little tilt. That tilt is the deflection angle, and then the particle keeps going. This is this blue line. Now I observe the radiation <laughs> at any given direction in, the, the in that hemisphere, okay? Not necessarily very close to, <coughs> to the direction of deflection. And we reconstruct the far field 
by Huygens, namely uh, by taking every point in this black plane as an emitter of a wave and then we sum over all the, we interfere all this, these waves. But when you do this, you have to be very careful with phases, okay? And they are geometric phases simply due to the fact that, okay, s depending on where you look, some, some points are farther than others from the, you know, from the point where you do your calculation. But on top of, this is also true in optics, but if you are in gravity, you also have to take into account uh, time delays. Okay, so there are so-called shifts uh, that you have to apply. For instance, just to make one well-known example, this Z minus is the time shift. You know, it's time is actually this uh, particular combination of space and time, which gets shifted as this particle hits, you know, encounters the other particle at impact parameter B is minus 2r log b. This is the shift. However, okay, in, in, in the wave which is emitted <coughs> in the sense of Huygens by this point x, you know, will suffer a gravitational shift which is not log b but log of this, of the length of this vector x minus b. So this is this log of b minus x squared. Now, so you have to combine all these waves and you have to subtract the contribution from the, from the shock wave. So you have to look at the metric, but then subtract the contribution to the metric coming from the shock wave because that has nothing to do with radiation, okay? That would be there anyway. So this is the formula, it's, it's not very simple, but it's not very complicated either. I can write it in as you can see in one slide, there is some little bit of notation. Now this is just general, okay, this, um, <coughs> this, quant this observed quantity is related to what I call news functions, okay, which you have, uh, we, which you define at sky, sky plus if <coughs> you want, but uh, very far from the source. And uh, so this is a crucial object. It takes the form of a <coughs> two-dimensional integral because you integrate over all these points on this plane and then you reconstruct all these uh, this, this waves which contain, as you can see, the gravitational <coughs> retardation effects plus ge pure geometric effects. And what is important to, to notice is that uh, when you subtract the deflected shock wave, you get something nicer than if you don't. Because for instance, if you go to small x, these two exponents become the same. And so this, this object <coughs> goes to zero at x goes to zero. You see, and, and you know, removes some singular behavior coming from this object. This object is not nothing but the Riemann tensor associated with the shock wave, you know, projected along uh, some direction, okay? You know, the, the shock wave has no Ricci, but has a Riemann associated with it, and it's quite simple. Okay, so this is the explicit formula. Um, and now you see you can study uh, the emitted radiation both in terms of omega and in terms of the deflection or of the observation angle and uh, we prefer to write it not in terms of the observation angle but this theta tilde which is the different you know which is the observation angle with respect to the direction uh, the deflected um, shock wave okay because it seems <coughs> to play a more important role than the angle itself. Okay, now I will give you the property of the spectrum, but okay, before doing that, let me get to the quantum treatment of the same problem. 
in very simple terms. So in these two papers with um, my Florentine friends, Ciafaloni, Colferai, and later on a third C, <laughs> looks like the Soviet Union, you know, CCCV. <laughs> The same problem had is addressed at the quantum level, and uh, so improving on what I told you before. In 2007, we got this energy crisis. Now, um, there are important points physically, I mean, before going to any details. There is one observation which I think is crucial. In the usual soft graviton recipe, Weinberg 65, you only take emission from the external legs to leading order, to li to for very small uh, soft gravitons. You only take the emission from the, uh, uh, from the external legs. Now indeed, when you look at the subleading terms, there is also a term which comes from internal emission and which is needed for gauge invariance, for covariance, okay? But we don't know yet whether that is related to what we are doing here. But certainly, we do keep emission from the uh, internal legs as well if the graviton is not extremely soft. Uh, and the reason is that the internal gravitons, I don't know if I have a picture of the ladder, okay. Um, Okay, the, the, the elastic process, before we <coughs> talk about any emission, is determined by a sum of ladder diagrams. Now, the ladder diagrams, of course, has uh, ranks, okay, along the ladder. These are the gravitons you exchange between the two very energetic quanta. Now, usually you would not include emission from, from these exchange gravitons. Uh, Okay, because of the <coughs> usual recipe, but uh, what turns out to be the case is that these are very close to the mass shell. So they are almost on shell. They are almost like the external particles, okay? The technical reason for that is something which has been called by Giddings, I think, fractionation of the exchange transverse momentum. This is perhaps a point worth spending a few words. If you have this high energy collision and the deflection angle is finite, even, sm even if small, of course the momentum transfer in the, in the process is huge. If you had a single graviton carry out all this transverse momentum, that graviton would be far off shell and there would be no no reason to include emission of other soft gravitons from that off-shell <coughs> object. But as it turns out, what dominates this process is the exchange of so many gravitons that each one of them is very close to the mass shell. So for this reason, the emission from the exchange gravitons cannot be, um, <coughs> cannot be uh, neglected for not so soft gravitons. But these not so soft gravitons are very crucial to compute the energy loss. So if you are only interested in the zero frequency limit, fine, you already know the answer. If you are interested to know the spectrum in some range of omega and integrate it to find the efficiency <laughs> of the process for producing gravitational waves, then you, have, you are facing this problem. So in fact, yeah, I added this question mark. Is this taken <coughs> care of by this non-leading correction to the soft theorems? This is what we are trying to check, but it, we don't know the answer yet. Do you understand in terms of diagrams the fact that you emit from the shock wave, <coughs> which is uh, separated from the particle? Um, because the particle is still very... Yes. Um, well, you mean you mean in the same when I drew my my picture. It looks like uh, this on shell effective. Uh, yeah. 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 I th I think there is some point to it. 
namely that um, there, there is a relation between emitting from the full There's shock no wave and from the inter interior of the graph and the fact that not only the insertion on the external lines count. There's I no think there is a relation. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Now, the exact details I don't think are clear, but uh, there is certainly a relation, yeah. Now, uh, the second important point is, and this is where the new scale appears, you know, omega of order 1 over r, so a very small frequency, it appears because of some decoherence effects. Uh, the, the reason is the following. Um, the, the emitted gravitons can be emitted from any rung in the ladder. However, if, the, if omega is smaller than r to the minus 1, this emission is coherent, namely uh, it adds up coherently. But if omega is bigger than r to the minus 1, then it turns out that uh, there is a suppression. Say not, OK, if you, if you emit a graviton from, say, the first rank, and you want to reabsorb it, you know, when you do your, 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 your S matrix and then you square it, OK? You want to find the you, you try to interfere <coughs> this with the absorption from the last rank, then you find a mismatch uh, of, uh, of momentum transfer, okay? Because simply the trajectory has bent and so on and so forth. So, but we can see that in the mathematics, of course, but uh, this is the physical explanation. So uh, this, this produces a damping, a further damping of the, of the, of the spectrum for omega bigger than r to the minus 1. So this characteristic scale, which is the Hawking scale, eh, the Hawking radiation scale, appears at that point. So, and this decoherence causes a break from this flat spectrum. I told you that at omega equals 0, the spectrum is flat, is omega independent. Well, above r to the minus 1, it's no longer flat. It just starts to fall, OK? Which is a nice, very interesting feature. Now. OK, I want to make this, this story a little bit short because at first, in the first paper, we were taking only this, ev this effect into account. We got something which was close, but not quite what we were getting with the classical calculation. The same function, if you, I don't know if you paid attention, you may be too tired, uh, the same function that appears in the classical treatment appears, but there it was exponentiated. Here it, ca it comes uh, in the numerator. <laughs> uh, however, we then discovered that the we were missing another effect. And uh, this is simply this, this iconal phase. And when you have, well, you, are you emit a graviton, uh, <coughs> you say, Instead of two bodies, you have three bodies, and you have to to look at the at the phase, at the iconal phase for this three-body system, which consists of three terms, and this is not quite the same as the two-body um, phase. You take also this into account, and then eh? what is, a uh, is the emitted graviton. Oh. You look at the single graviton, so you have the two particles plus the third. Oh. Now. You see, if you have only two, we know the iconal phase is, is just a function of uh, lo with a log of b square and with a prefactor. Now we have to do the same for the three pairs of the three particles. It doesn't add up exactly the same thing. And when you take this correction into account, magically, you get exactly the, uh, the classical result if you take, the, I don't know, I, uh, no, did I, yeah, no, I, do, I, do, I don't even have it here, yeah. Um, you get exactly the same result that we got from the classical calculation. I mean, there is this limit to be taken, but it's <coughs> really very trivial. I mean, the quantum calculation gives this. Of course, there is an h-bar here if omega is a frequency, so you expand 
this quantity for a small argument, and then you get the classical result. So th that's the only little step from going from the quantum to the classical result. Okay, so mm, I'm half an hour, yeah, slightly late, I guess. So let me describe the spectrum, okay? We have <coughs> analyzed mostly numerically the property of the spectrum in the classical limit. And um, mm, let me illustrate it first by saying a few things, and then I have some pictures. So the spectrum is like this. For omega between 1 over b and 1 over r, these are two very distinct scales because the ratio is very small, uh, the spectrum is almost flat, OK? It's flat up to a log. That's what we find. However, uh, the approximations really, this, uh, this um, mm, Huygen-Fraunhofer approximations breaks down. And we believe that below this scale, uh, this log freezes down. Okay? You, don't, you cannot go just to 0. You can go down up to omega over the b to the minus 1. If you insert that value, you get precisely the zero frequency limit. So what we believe is that the validity of the actual zero frequency limit, uh, limit is limited by 1 over b. Okay? Up to 1 over b, it's pretty safe to use this. Above 1 over b, but below 1 over r, this is the result we get. However, above r to the minus 1, because of this decoherence effect, and I, okay, I can explain more detail, uh, the spectrum becomes, if you want, scale invariant. I mean, in this simple sense, that d, d omega is like e over omega up to this uh, theta square factor. So it's small and scales like 1 over omega, which, of course, gives a log. If you trust this up to arbitrarily high omega, gives an efficiency which diverges logarithmically. Whereas previously, with this uh, constant spectrum, the divergence was linear. OK, now we don't know exactly we know that our some approximations break down, and they break down roughly at this at a scale omega star, which is one over r divided by the scattering angle to the minus two. Now, another thing, an amusing thing, is that uh, at if we use that formula above that scale, then you start to violate something which is not an, a sacred bound. It's called the Dyson bound. I think this I learned from uh, uh, Gary. Um, that is called <laughs> Dyson bound. That maybe there is a bound on d, d, t, which has precisely the dimensions of 1 over g Newton. Um, now, it's not clear that this is an absolute bound in, in nature. But it could very well be that it's a true bound for this process. So if we assume that kind of uh, cutoff, then of course you can even compute the total efficiency for emitting gravitational <coughs> waves. And it comes out <coughs> like that. And we argued with, uh, with Grusinov that above, the spectrum should become omega to the minus 2 instead of omega to the minus 1. And then OK, we later realized that uh, 1 over omega squared, I don't know if you know, is also the spectrum or time integrated spectrum of the evaporation of a Schwarzschild black hole, according to Hawking. I mean, if you collect all your quanta, then the spectrum ends up being 1 over omega squared. OK. This is, I will skip it, is an explanation of how you get these different behaviors in these different regions. There are regions in which you can trust Weinberg's approximation. <laughs> Other region you have to go over to 
work by Lipatov that can be considered as an improvement of Weinberg when the frequency is not so small. And uh, okay, this is a plot, you know, frequency and also the scattering angle. So it depends also what I gave you. Uh, it was integrated over the angle, and this more differential description explains better how the various regimes uh, behave. But okay, you can look it up in the transparencies. And okay, so there are some nice pictures. Uh, Fizrev apparently liked them, and they put them in some gallery of, fig of figures that they have. <laughs> I don't know that what my collaborators told me. But for instance, this, is, I think, is an, uh, oh, sorry, this <laughs> is an amusing picture. So this, this would be the, the spectrum uh, as a function of omega. It's integrated over azimuth, but still this uh, <coughs> theta over theta s, or maybe it's theta tilde. I'm not sure. I think it's theta tilde over theta s. Uh, so this is the frequency. This is the angular distribution. And this is the plateau, uh, the zero frequency plateau. But if you if you go to uh, zero, which means omega r equal one, uh, then all of a sudden the plateau ends. And the other steep, uh, you know, these steep curves, one is due to phase space and the lack of collinear divergence, and the other is the transverse momentum cutoff. This is simply kinematical boundary. So basically, uh, the efficiency comes from integrating over this plateau. But there is this one over omega tail that still. OK, then, uh, OK, we, as I said, we had a nice picture where we, uh, for different values of omega, we give the full angular distribution in theta and phi. and. Uh, OK. Now, we, we now want to understand two things. E what uh, provides the large frequency cutoff? And also, we'd like to extend the reasoning towards large angle of the collapse regime. And there have been some first step done by Ciafaloni and Colferai in a recent paper. Now, what I want to stress is that the emerging picture seems to be quite appealing, namely the transverse momenta are limited by 1 over b. The longitudinal ones are controlled by the larger scale 1 over r, with some leakage at high frequencies. Now, if that behavior persists, as you approach some critical impact parameter at which collapse should occur, that would give a rather interesting final state, because the distribution will become more and more isotropic, the average number of quanta that you produce is of order of the entropy of a black hole, and the characteristic energy is of order of the Hawking temperature. So I think this ends part one, and I have 15 or so minutes. So maybe I will go quickly over the second part, uh, uh, because, OK, it's unrelated, but the conclusions are similar. So it, it adds to the whole picture. So the second part is about a claim, a recent claim by, well, not so recent, but a <laughs> claim by Valley and Company. Here is the full list. It's in D equal 4, like also in my previous discussion. No attempt to project on a fixed impact parameter, on a fixed partial wave. So if you want, well, I didn't show this before, but in in a plane in which you have the energy and the impact parameter of the collision, okay, uh, with Amati and Ciappaloni, we were always discussing different regimes in this plane. Now they integrate over impact parameter, okay? So they look at the whole thing, hopefully also picking up contributions from this <coughs> right region, which is where classically you expect to collapse, okay? This is the rather standard picture. So what uh, they have considered is an interesting process. They took two initial, so the initial state is precisely our initial state. 
two ultra high energy gravitons okay and they looked specifically at n final gravitons where n is so large that the uh, the energy of the of the final gravitons is ultra low energy instead of ultra high energy now typically they but this is only typically they would like to come to this as a prediction typically the energy of the final particle would be of the order of the Hawking temperature associated with the incoming energy and they claim that in uh, uh, both in quantum field theory but also in string theory they can estimate the three level I should have underlined three level cross section at large n by you know some smart techniques about computing scattering amplitudes <coughs> um, uh, how are they called scattering equations or string equations I forgot okay string equations okay so they come up with this uh, ans with, with this uh, result for very large n so which you can roughly understand this n factorial is typical in, in field theory when you have two to n processes for large n um, then this factor can be understood because the, uh, the, the average invariant energy of two particles is uh, square root of s over n so, uh, so that's, uh, that's a typical interaction between two of the final gravitons uh, to the n because that's the number of particles so, uh, by the way, thi this fudge factors, E squared C, oh, C is not the speed of light, C is a constant over the one, E squared is put for convenience. Uh, is e, e is E. Uh, it's really well, that's an Euler's number. Yeah. Euler's number. Yeah, yeah, it's put for convenience because then if you look take, take the large and limit, E squared disappears uh, and it goes like this. Okay, for large n. You can think of it this way. Now, now then, this formula can be roughly understood, as I said. Um, however, with an argument that I cannot follow, <laughs> we have been corresponding with them, they picked up a, preci a precise value of n. And they picked up this value of n. OK, if you think n equals just the numerator, then you work it out very easily. You get a cross-section which goes like e to the minus n. And n, okay, uh, is 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 the uh, this n is of the order of the of course of the entropy of a black hole of mass square root of s. Now, but this n does not correspond to the dominant n in the sum. Okay, uh, if you take the n which maximizes this expression, that is not at this value but at this value well you see they <coughs> differ by a factor e square and there the cross section is exponentially large not exponentially small so it makes a big difference now then they say they add a final state entropy factor e to the plus s to kill this e to the minus s and they they argue that somehow uh, this final state such can saturate unitarity but you know this final state entropy factor is put by hand so what is a parameter small s small no is a uh, small s is e square is the Mandelstam variable is just the center of mass energy square yeah sorry should have defined everything so uh, like it was in in all my previous yeah, slides I'm yeah <laughs> so this okay this is a, is also the mass of a black hole that you supposedly form and the reason why we take by the way transplanckian collisions is that we would like to form black holes larger than a planck length okay and that's why you need transplanckian energy okay so um wha what we did with um okay you can criticize very much, I mean, this, uh, this, uh, this argument because exclusive cross-sections have infrared singularities. So, of course, at three level you don't see them, but if you add loops, 
you expect to have all sorts of divergences in the loop corrections. And uh, at three level, the, uh, the exclusive cross-section should, should uh, blow up because of soft quanta <coughs> being emitted. And um, or at fixed multiplicity, the virtual corrections, after they are resummed, they make the <coughs> any exclusive cross-section uh, go to zero. So you only you have to define suitably inclusive enough cross sections which are free from infrared problems. And so that's what we did with Adazi Bianchi and Bianchi, and we gave a reinterpretation of the uh, of their results that seems to resolve its tension with the, <coughs> the other work and even eventually justify qualitatively at least. Uh, their basic claim. So the rest of, uh, of my talk was about how to define these uh, uh, inclusive cross-sections in the case of gravity, where we use the fact that there are no collinear singularities. So in a sense, the, the problem is simpler. You know, you, you only have to allow for um, emission of extra stuff soft stuff. So you have virtual corrections and real emission and as usual they cancel each other in suitably defined quantities. So we define something like gravi gravitational jets but they are not jets because of the absence of collinear singularities. So you only look at how many hard quant hard quanta you produce and then you don't look at the softer quanta and you put some bound on how much energy can go into this unobserved <coughs> soft quanta. So this is <coughs> a, a, an infrared safe quantity. And by the way, we, we found, this could be amusing, we found a, a nice formula for the, mm, uh, for the gravitational, uh, well, this is a virtual correction uh, virtual graviton corrections to a 2 to n process, which, as Weinberg argued, has a smooth massless limit. And the massless limit is, is he never wrote it down, even for 2 to 2 processes, it has this nice formula S log S plus T log T plus U log U, if you want. But I mean, if it was a, a, a two to two process, it would be S log S plus T log T plus U log U, which by the way is the same exponent which appears in the beta function at fixed angle. <laughs> and, but this is the generalization to two to N. And so, and you we, we studied this B0 factor, which is the damping factor due to virtual corrections. It is always positive and uh, for instance, is, is if the process is completely collinear, 2 to n, but everything goes in the same direction, this B0 goes to 0, but that's the only case in which it is 0. And if, for instance, the particles are emitted at in the transverse plane with respect to the collision, then it maximizes and so on. Uh, anyway, the bottom line, I want to jump to it, is that, again, the scale 1 over r appears naturally, in fact, if bar E, E bar is bigger than TH, E bar is the energy uh, threshold for calling it a jet or a, a, a hard graviton, then if you take this threshold too high, higher than the Hawking temperature, then that cross-section will be damped, it will be very small. So you have to <coughs> allow indeed for uh, quanta like Hawking quanta, and then eventually find uh, single jet cross sections which have even the, the Hawking factor. Okay, <laughs> I want to cut this story short and jump. So, to if you want a conclusion or even a question, you could say, uh, we would like to say that perhaps we are talking here about pre collapse which could be the analog of QCD's pre-confinement. You know, many years ago I had a paper with Daniela Matti 
pointing out that the perturbative evolution of a QCD jet produces a partonic state which consists of many color singlets of limited mass and resembles energetically the hadronic <coughs> final state. But of course, some non-perturbative physics is was still necessary to get down to hadrons. And present codes, for instance, Herwig, uses very much this property of QCD jets. It adds to it gluon interference. So you see interference also comes in there. In fact, this IG in Herwig means interfering gluons. Now, in the gravity case, a general pattern seems to emerge where at the quantum level, the transition between the dispersive <coughs> and collapsed state phase is smoothed out, okay? <laughs> Classically, you either collapse or you don't collapse. And here, somehow, uh, as you approach the collapse region, it seems that things change only gradually and smoothly. So as uh, one approaches a critical value for B, for the impact parameter, the nature of the final state appears to change smoothly, maybe rapidly, but smoothly, from one characteristic of a dispersive final state to one with high multiplicity and soft quanta, which is reminiscent of Hawking's radiation with high multiplicity and uh, average energies of the order of the Hawking temperature. Of course, <laughs> it's always up to numbers of order one. But even in this case, um, I didn't show exactly the, the spectra, but the spectra are not thermal. You know, the, the thermal Planck spectrum is very much uh, small, is, is quite depressed at small frequency, okay? we get more like a Bremsstrahlung spectrum, which is, uh, you know, has more quanta, uh, has a divergent number of quanta at low energy, although the energy carried by this low quanta is not divergent. <coughs> now, a Planck spectrum is much, much, uh, I cannot call it softer, <laughs> uh, much <coughs> less damped at small frequency. So, uh, we don't get we don't see any sign of thermalization. And uh, again, here, even if we can get to that stage, we'll need some non-perturbative physics for thermalization. So this is the classical picture. And we think that the quantum picture <coughs> may be smoother. I couldn't talk about related work in which in this uh, so-called string gravity regime, we can also try to approach this classical boundary between forming or not forming black holes. And here, too, you see this, this softening of the final state and uh, the emergence of the Hawking temperature scale. OK, I think that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm almost on time. Question. Thibault. Thibault. <laughs> if I sit along the critical line to form black hole, what what is what what do you predict about the variation of the total emitted um, energy in gravitational waves? Is this oh. is there a regime where it is small compared to square root of s, or it's always equal of the order of magnitude of square root of s? No. Okay. So uh, I I I think I, if I understand so. Forget about this. This is a string regime which we haven't discussed. So the regime that we have tried to describe is following this arrow. Uh, this is really when the scattering angle becomes of order one, and later you could enter the uh, black hole formation regime. Now I think and the mass energy loss is then equal to square root of s all along this line. That's uh, not exactly square root of s. No, no, no. It should be a finite fraction. I think yes. everybody agrees. Is it a finite fraction? Scale? Oh, we can. We have no control over. You see, that would depend on two things: on being able to find the true cutoff, omega star, one. 
second, to be able to really approach that line. That line corresponds to scattering angles of order 2 pi. <laughs> 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 the particles start to uh, coalesce. So at that scale, uh, OK, this is what Colferai and uh, Ciafaloni have done in this last paper, but admittedly, it's a lot of guesswork. So there, I think everybody, I don't know your opinion, uh, expects that there is a finite fraction that goes into radiation and the rest collapses. Now, the puzzle was that we were getting the same kind of result even uh, much, much before, when the angle is small. Now, we, we OK, now the result is more comfortable. But before we know exactly where to cut off, in my opinion, it's just that you know we make some linear approximation to some equations, and we <coughs> neglect some nonlinear terms. And those should fix the problem. But it's, it's not easy. It's not an easy. Yeah. No. Ask me what's wrong with this intuition. I have the intuition if you have two absolutely massless particles, it's suppo well, suppose it's classical, mm -hmm. that the things will come in and they'll just spiral and it'll gradually approach some thing with a conformal killing. Mm -hmm. like anyway, that'll just become <coughs> self similar and it'll just radiate all its energy away before it. So I would have I would have thought in the limit of massless particles, they could radiate all of their energy away before the, at the end. Well, in the end, you just get a zero mass black hole. Really? And oh. And then if you have less, you know, less impact parameter, then you'd form a bigger one. So I don't know. That that's that. that would no, be no. Guess. I mean, no, no, well, no. I th I think at least at sufficiently large impact parameter, there is simply deflection. That, right, that I think is the critical case. I'm oh, saying, the critical I'm case. I'm suggesting at the critical case, the critical. they just spiral, they spiral in, and so therefore each time, it, over a time scale, it's of order the, the energy remaining, mm -hmm. th then it emits roughly that energy. I mean, it just spirals in at some fixed state. I understand what you mean. Yeah, it could very well be that, they, that they, in the critical case, uh, the whole thing is radiated away, yeah. and you're left with no... Uh, with no black hole. Uh, the small oh. parameter for the fraction that you emit then at theta for the one. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it will be actually a, a lot of emission. <coughs> now, you say there will be a lot of emission of well, order I guess, one. I guess I'm just imagining that it emits, yeah. some, it's emitted as a, a, of order a fraction of the energy it has each revolution. And yeah, I understand your so argument. Yeah, just, yeah, just because you would like to form a in a, an extremal black hole, but uh, there will be a lot of emission that finally prevents you from forming it at all. That's yeah, what they are saying. Just, yeah, you just radiate yeah. away the Whereas if, I mean, if it's really you central... You acid particles, then, 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 no, of then it's the limit, you'd have, you'd have twice the rest mass of the particle. It, well, a little bit more. You could very well be true that, uh, that what signals uh, critical behavior is when I mean, you... If I knew how to do, how to do the numerical calculations, it would be an interesting thing, because the, well, you could have this cell similar solution. I mean, well, I, I, in a sense, continuity would also support what you say, right? Because before you collapse, you certainly send all the energy out to infinity. Now you say, as you approach the collapse, you still, there's no first order transition that all of a yeah. sudden you get half of the, uh, of, of the energy radiated. You know, before you collapse, certainly everything goes, comes out, right? Everything that goes in comes out. This yeah, is yeah, the I'm equality between- the, yeah, I'm just saying the limit. Of course, yeah, if I they understand. Each other, then of yeah, course you only you only you emit a finite fraction of the initial energy, but I'm saying in this limiting case, you yeah, emit yeah, all yeah, of the yeah, 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 which makes sense because it's uh, yeah. If you go just a little bit above, you don't collapse at all, and then right. all the energy also goes to infinity. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. I, 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 I think you have a good yeah. point. Uh, why? How is it possible to obtain a Hawking uh, something that could be identified as Hawking radiation? from a classical calculation, because of course there is the impact parameter that will give something that will be h bar, which is a nigro matter, but what is no. I, oh, I don't, I, you mean the classic, now you are referring to the classical calculation, eh? Well, well, first of all the classical calculation, but then no, how is it possible to control the quantum calculation to make uh, sure that this is hot radiation, not some other kind of uh, I don't. I, 
I don't know. I mean, what I can say is that um, mm, um, my collaborators are trying to keep the quantum part of the of the calculation. Well, of course, I think I think if you do an honest classical calculation, you shouldn't get any <coughs> radiation <coughs> out. Yes, and there should be a, a, a sharp transition between a regime of collapse and a regime of no collapse. These are these collapse criteria. The, I mean, on this basis, I drew this uh, critical line. Yes, so I mean, somehow the, uh, the quantum must be important. I think Wait. that for the radiation, uh, a small deflection angle I is probably OK. But as you approach the critical regime, who knows? But in the, in the power, will look uh, smooth, because even when I, you in the power, some of it will go away in rotational waves. Okay, if you if you only, I mean yeah, if you if yeah 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 yeah. No, you see, uh, yeah, I suspect that you at some point you need some real non-perturbative physics to tell you that you f you form some uh, long-lived metastable state, and that is very hard to see how. You could get it from here, you know, some kind yeah, of bound no states. Yeah, eh? non perturbable. Yeah, I, I presume. So, um, as I said, okay, uh, it's, it's, it's not about really black holes. That's why I apologized in the beginning. But I think the fact that you already see the, mer the emergence of some, some scales, it's, it's interesting. You see, it's very different from a Adronic reaction in which the energy of the final state scales with the energy of the initial state. Okay, you have Feynman scaling. You look at single particle distribution in adronic physics, they typically scale, you know, the energy of the final particle is proportional to the energy of the incoming particle. Here is inverse proportion. That's what comes out. And this is because the effective coupling constant is, is Gs. So it contains two powers of energy. And that is also the typical multiplicity. So when you divide square root of s by s, you get one of <laughs> square root of s. It's as simple as that. Just a small comment. In the, <coughs> in the semi-relativistic regime of light though, where indeed at merger, the velocity is half the velocity of light, the uh, instantaneous uh, gravitational wave flux is a milli Dyson. It's ten minus three, so it's a thing where you milli Dyson. <laughs> so you could think it's still relativistic. Things are for their unity, so you could get very non-perturbative. But this is a regime where there is still a small parameter, and one can describe even the transition, the merger, the transition mm -hmm. by very simple. Uh, I mean, EOB is fine. Mm -hmm. and describe everything. So I would not, I would still expect that even in the ultra relativistic thing, gravity has this property, I agree with the value for this, of uh, uh, containing its own cut of softening. I think so too. And then we would not see, we would see very smooth things. Yeah, I, I, I agree too. That's my expectation. Somehow general relativity should know how to cure this problem on its own without uh, invoking quantum mechanics for this problem. <coughs> okay. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much.